Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning, Crossroads Church. My name is Marcus. I'm the lead pastor here. And Pastor Jerome, who's our teaching pastor, he is in Corpus, and he'll be back here this next week. But for all of you who are here, and this is your first time, welcome to Crossroads. Welcome home. And for those of you who are online, we love you. Um, take some time next time and come by the, our area and visit us at the 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock services. We appreciate you guys coming. I heard about a time when little Johnny wanted to know what it was like to be married. So he asked his dad, what's it like to be married, dad? And big Johnny who was his dad. He goes, little Johnny, leave me alone. So little Johnny's a little confused. And then his dad comes back a few minutes later. He goes, little Johnny, why are you ignoring me? He's even more confused. He goes, that's what it's like to be married. (laughs) Thought that was cute. I had to share that with you this morning. So we began a new series entitled The Elephant in the Family Room. And so we are going to be addressing issues that people don't like to talk about, but Crossroads Church loves to talk about some of these things. And so we're going to take the month of February to address some of these uh, issues that sometimes... um, they go disregarded and people pay no attention to. And next thing you know, there's a big mess in your house. Imagine a six-ton elephant in your home. We're not talking about your spouse or your mother-in-law. Oh We're talking about just this massive beast in the middle of your house. I mean, what would happen if you just ignore it? I mean, all kinds of stuff would happen. Things would be broken, damaged, all kinds of stuff would take place. Actually, I was scrolling through some YouTube stuff, and we actually found a video of an elephant inside of a person's home. Draw your attention to the screen real quick. Ah! 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 That ain't going to help. Ah! crazy, isn't it? Anybody ever had that experience? (laughs) Okay, I'm just wanting to make sure. But do you ever know any families who actually never addressed the stuff that needed to be addressed? It was obvious to everyone else, or maybe to you, but they just never decided to address it. Anybody know families like that? Mm, Yeah. And or, you know, they call like like the three monkeys, you know, you hear no evil, you see no evil. What's the third one? You you speak no evil. Uh, Or like the ostrich, you just put your head in the sand, you bury it, and you pay no uh, attention to it. Um, you, you guys can probably relate to this, but I remember in elementary school, we probably all had a, a friend or someone in the classroom that everybody ignored or everybody shunned away because he stank. Like, man, this guy stinks. And they were, they, you know, I had a guy, Charlie, who was just like that. Like, everybody disregarded him. He, was, he actually was a little bully. Well, the reason why, because he always had to defend himself, but he still stank. And uh, so somebody had to address it, so Pastor Avalos did. Of course, I was a little Avalos there. He called me Sweet A. <laughs> Sweet A had to go and talk to him. Hey, have you ever, you ever hear about something called deodorant? What you talking about, Sweet A? And so I had to show him with things. We don't know. We don't have that kind of stuff. Well, they didn't have enough money to buy any of that stuff. And so we had to just help him and at least, you know, learn how to take a shower or whatever. And so um, we had to address, we didn't, there was obviously something going on and somebody had to address the situation so change could take place or otherwise we'd spend the whole year in the middle of a smelly room. And we spent a part, the worst thing about COVID is that for me anyways, whenever I got it a couple years ago, is that I lost my smell. <laughs> and so I couldn't smell after a while, I couldn't smell food, I couldn't even smell myself. So every now and then that would be like, hey, hey, you stink. Like What? So now I'm all self-conscious and stuff, so I'm trying to see if I smell, and I still can't smell, but I'm making sure, it's like, babe, smell me. Make sure that I'm not, you know, I've got to put some deodorant on. And God knows, I apologize if I've been around you and I stink. But still, we are in a situation where we have to address uh, the issues that we face. My advice to you is to not be like the monkey, don't be like an ostrich, don't be like the elephants. Let's just be humans. Let's be humans and address the stuff. The title of this morning's message is called Peacemaker. Can you say peacemaker with me? Peacemaker. And the end result of a peacemaker, a true peacemaker, peacemaker, a peacemaker who's following Jesus is that you'll wind up having peace within yourself and peace with God, obviously. 
And here's what I know about every single one of us here in this room, is that every single one of you here, regardless of what background, what family you're in, the environment that you're in, you desire more peace in your house. In your, um, in last, last year during Christmas time, you remember when y'all were here, for those of you who are here, we had a Christmas tree and we guys had some ornaments. And uh, on these ornaments, y'all put y'all's prayer requests and some of the desires that y'all had uh, for 2023. Well, I have that. I have all those ornaments in our living room. We have this thing called a prayer bowl. There's a picture of it on the screen. And it's right there in front of our uh, doorway when we come in. So in the morning, we wake up, get some coffee, doing some study, and I'll take a handful of these, and we're praying for them. Most of them are autonomous. They don't know, we don't know who they are, but we're praying for you. And based upon these requests, we know that people are looking for peace. They're finding, they're trying to, they've got to find some peace in their house. Things like, I need freedom from addiction. Uh, I, I, I really want to change my ways, be a better person, and get closer to God. I want to get out of debt and be debt-free so that I can purchase our new house. I, I want to break, I want to, I want to see my mom break so that she'll have a softened heart and be able to forgive and quit holding on to the stuff that's happened in the past. I need family reconciliation, uh, a prayer to be a better man, a better Christian man, so that I could uh, be more giving with my heart to others and to my household. I need to heal my broken heart. I need, uh, my family just needs peace and unity, financial peace for family members can be together. There's strife and division in the home. They just want to be together. And so every one of these individuals here are looking for something that we all want to look for in our houses, just to, just to have not necessarily easy road, but to have some peace and address some of the things. We'll never get to those places. Every single one of these, they're going to have to talk about some stuff because of the tension or the stuff that's taking place in their home. So they have to address it. They can't avoid it. If they want more in 2023, they have to face some of these issues. Do you agree with me? And you got to talk about your spending habits. You got to talk about your health. You got to talk about the alcoholism that's in the home. You got to talk about your weight. You got to talk about the pills that you're taking. We got to talk about why dad's silent all the time and mom's angry all the time. Mom's popping pills and drinking her wine while dad's looking at pornography in the back room. You got to talk about some of those issues. Are you guys out there in this Presbyterian church? Yes. Okay, good. We got to address the family history tendencies. You got to address why your teens are choosing those type of friends and bringing them home. You got to address some of the things about your, your, your will or uh, your mortality that's going to take place here in a few years. Some of these things, they, they're unavoidable, but if we choose to bury our head in the sands, they'll never get addressed. And the sooner you address them, the more peace you'll have in the household. Bottom line is God has answers for every single one of these situations we're facing and situations you're facing only if we choose not to ignore the elephant that's in the room. Does that make sense? Yes. And so this morning, we're going to take a look, and we're going to start in Matthew's gospel, the sixth chapter, where it says in the verse 9, it says, uh, Jesus is speaking. He says, God blesses those who work for peace. Uh, another translation says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Now, here's the background. Here's the context in that passage. I, I was there um, when Pastor Joel and I went, went uh, hiking up in Jerusalem in Israel. We climbed up the Sermon on the Mount. We climbed up that mountainside where the Beatitudes were, were preached at. And the background of this particular context, Jesus had just finished. He was addressing um, people that were sick and they were afflicted and they were, you know, paralytics and they were going through seizures and all kinds of various diseases. He was in there and he was moved with compassion. And he didn't run away from them or shy away from them. There was conflict going on right before his eyes. And he went up to the mountainside to address these things. He ministered to them, but then he addressed them as a whole. And he says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who work for peace. That's what he was doing. He was engaged in their lives, working on behalf of his father so they can have peace in their home. There's a big difference between being a peacemaker and being a peacekeeper. Isn't that right? A peacemaker, a peacekeeper is constantly avoiding conflict. They avoid the discomfort of conflict. I don't know about you. How many guys love conflict here other than Pastor Joel and Natalie and Alora? Really, Alora? You need a gummy bear, girl. <laughs> um, they avoid, I call it hydroplaning through their issues. You know, anybody ever know what hydroplaning is? You're just skimming the surface of that road, and you're going to crash if that's all you do eventually. And so people that are just peacekeepers, they avoid 
conflict. And the favorite line of a peacekeeper is, man, it's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal that they're hanging out with it. Come on, wife. Are you kidding me? Let them hang around with those guys. They're just doing a little bit of drugs here and there. You know, popping mom's pills or whatever. They, it's no harm. No, you know, no big deal. My daughter, my oldest daughter, she would bring home. She was like a, always on the edge bringing home friends. Because we always, our house was the, the house everybody came to. And then all of a sudden, our teenage girl, she went off a little bit for, for a season. Actually, for a long season. Actually, she's still off. But she um, would bring homes, and they were all spiky and goth-looking and, you know, just different lifestyles, just all this stuff. And she thought that I would, Natalie and I would kind of be moved by that. So it's like, oh, yeah, welcome them. Come on here. Come to church. And they'll come to church, and I'd sit them in the front row. And, of course, people were looking at me like, Pastor, do you know what your daughter's doing? I was like, yeah, do you know what your daughter's doing? <laughs> But you got to address some of these things. you got to talk about it. World peace doesn't come when two leaders come together and they join hands and they start singing, we are the world, we are the children. That's a pretty good tone right there. <laughs> Jeremiah, I'll be here Tuesday night, right? Um, I love that song. Anybody ever love that song? Nope. I don't know why. No, you didn't either, but just, there comes a time. Anyways. <clears throat> you got to address some of those things. World peace doesn't come to, you know, with shenanigans like that. they got to address the stuff. they got to address the issues. they got to create boundaries. they got to set expectations. they got to remind people that, hey, there's consequences if you don't do that. you got to talk about the stuff, the spy thing that's up in the air. you got to talk about these things. It's just not going to go away and, uh, by avoiding it. It won't happen that way. You know, here's, here's a great illustration I shared in the 9 o'clock. This is for all of us. But if you're driving your car and you hear it and it's getting louder, it's probably something wrong. Okay? Our mechanic, Andy, I always talk, I'll call him up. I was like, hey, Andy. He says, I hear this noise. He goes, oh, it'll be all right. Just turn the radio up. I was cracking up. Kim, she's not here in the front row anymore, but Kim, we know our admin, she sold us a, a truck not too long ago. And little did she know that, you know, and I started hearing this. I was on my way to the men's encounter last year, and I started hearing that noise. Tick, 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 tick. I was like, but I just checked oil. It was, it was full of oil. And so I went over there, and we were on our way back. The whole engine exploded. I'm like, gee, Kim, what the heck? <laughs> we could have had, yeah, poor Kim. She's like, I knew that was going to happen. I was like, well, why didn't you tell me? I wouldn't have paid all this money. But we worked it out. It's all good. Uh, but if we avoid the issues, you just wind up getting in a big old mess. Isn't that the truth? But peacemakers, they come from a different line of thinking. Peacemakers, they embrace conflict. Notice in Jesus in that story, he, didn't, he leaned in towards the mess. He ran towards the mess. He didn't avoid it. Right. And, and peacekeepers, they take the path of least resistance. But peacemakers, they take the path of discipleship. And the, the path of discipleship is, man, day after day, week after week, you're grinding it out. You know, you don't make just one decision. And, you know, whenever I came to Christ, I had some stinking thinking. When God delivered the children of Israel out of Pharaoh's hand, they were free and they were in the promised land, but they still had Egypt thinking. And so they wanted to, that's why they wanted to go back. And so discipleship is a path where you just constantly uh, look at issues, Talk about those issues, address those issues, modify your behavior, and let God's spirit work inside of you so that you can become uh, reflecting the character of God more when we're out there sharing the gospel message to people, right? Think about Jesus. In Ephesians, the second chapter, the 14th verse, it says, He himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made the two groups. There was two groups going on when he came. There were either people that were children of God or people who were the enemy of God. He says two groups came in and he made them one and he destroyed the barrier, that dividing wall of hostility. The people were hostile towards God. Why? Because sin was in the way. And a holy God couldn't hang out in the same place where sin abound. And so Jesus had to come in and he, for the sake of peace and people having peace with God, he had to work. And there was holy sweat. And there was blood. And there was sweat. 
and there was tears and there was thorns and there was stripes and there was weeping and there was whips and there was nails and there were screams and there was cries and there was hammers and there was demons that were addressed and emotional exhaustion and fights within. Why? Because he did not want us to become an enemy of God and remain that way. He wanted us to become children of our Heavenly Father. And he addressed it. He had to address that situation. That's why the Apostle Paul in the epistles that he writes, he, he cries out. He says, hey, hit that next verse. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see that you're honorable. If you're going to address issues, do it with this motivation in, in mind, that we are going to do it in a Christ-like manner, and the whole motivation so that we can become uh, followers of Christ that reflect my Father's nature here on this earth. Because every time you point a finger, you have a tendency to point a finger and know that there's three others pointing right back at you. And so you have to do it in an honorable way when we're addressing. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do whatever you can. Don't just bury it in the sand. Address the situation for one purpose only. When we do our band of brothers, we do it for one purpose only. So we can become better men here on this earth. Better fathers. Better husbands. Better brothers. Better pastors. Better leaders. We're not doing it to shame people. We're doing it because, man, we want to honor God with our lives. And it's important for us to do that. He goes, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. And so a lot of times if you're in a situation where people are addressing the elephant that's in the room that no one's ever addressed, we just buckle up. Like, what are you talking about, man? Look at your crap. We're not talking about my crap. We're talking about your crap. But you got to have someone that you can trust to have those kind of relationships and have that kind of dialogue. Jesus went about doing good, healing. He addressed the conflict, the tension, the elephant in the room. Why? To better people. He addressed the woman who was caught in the middle of adultery. He went down to her level. He says, did you see anybody else offending you? Well, neither do I. But go and do this no more. Does that make sense? So it's important for us. But what do peacemakers do? Let's ask that question. Thank you for asking. What do they do? By the way, it's in your notes there. If you looked at a connect, you looked inside of it, all those are in there. You just need to fill in those blanks. It's also on your app if you want to follow me along. But what do peacemakers do? And I know this is a very simple, uh, basic introduction message, but I did this on purpose because sometimes the simple things, you know, it's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little things that everybody knows but don't do that need to be addressed sometimes. Make sense? Yeah. So I'm in pastor mode. Is that okay? Yes. All right. Don't shout me down. You guys, are, you guys are very quiet today. There's a bunch of you guys here, by the way, also. We're going to have to get to third service, which is awesome. But what do peacemakers do? One, they got to be willing to talk about it. Say talk about it. Okay. Notice in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it says this. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. We're not going to speak the truth to condemn you, to shame you, to bury you to put it on Facebook. We're going to speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. That's the motivation behind it. It's because, man, I know there's better in you, Emmanuel. I know, there's, not that there's anything wrong with you, I'm just saying. But I know that there's better in me. When guys come up to me, my pastor used to come up to me and he used to address issues in my life. And he'd always remind me, he was a Vietnam vet. He goes, I got 21 ways to kill you. I was like, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> address them all. <laughs> But it was just real cool because he did it in such a, man, I would, uh, his eyes would pierce, the love of God would pierce through his eyes into my heart. And I would just sit there and I would listen to an elderly man who knew about life more than I did. And I was willing to listen and make some adjustments and carry forth and be accountable to somebody like that. I read a quote this past week. I thought it was from my therapist, but it was actually from Winston Churchill. But it says, uh, you guys might have heard this, to jaw jaw is always better than war war. Jaw jaw is always better than war war because my tendency, my therapy, my tendency is to shut down. It's very easy for me to hide away. I always have talks with myself all the time. Anybody ever do that? I'm constantly getting in trouble because I tell the staff, like, hey, do you remember, remember when we talked about this? They're like, we didn't talk about that. It's like, yeah, we did. And it wasn't, I didn't, I just, my whole conversation was here. I get in trouble at home for this. I was like, babe, you remember this? You didn't say that. It's like, yes, I did. Gosh, woman, you're hard of hearing. <laughs> but those are the tendencies. But he goes, it's always better to communicate and talk rather than go into war. 
And so it's very important for us to do that. And as a pastor, I don't like conflict. I hate conflict. And I had my fair share of just getting out of the room because I'm like, I'll come back later when things have settled down because I don't want to be in that thing. But you know what I've learned? This pastoring, this role in my life, I've been doing this 37, almost 38 years doing this. It's a long time. And I'm still happy. (laughs) I still love doing what I'm doing. I really do. I'm not allowed all the craziness in our lives mess up my innocence for God, my love for my father. I'll never let I'll never let anyone do that. No one has power over that but me. I give that power up. But I won't do it. <clears throat> it's important for us, but I don't like conflict. But you know what I hate worse than conflict? I hate worse, I hate cancer. I hate the cancer of griping and division and dissension in the body of Christ. I hate that worse than I do uh, conflict. And so I stand up in those places. I was like, hey, I've got to address the situation. I will not allow that to take place where the body will be destroyed. Because stuff like that could destroy a whole body. And just, you, you, we have no authority to speak into people's lives when we're not addressing issues in our own lives. So it's very important for us to have a clear conscience we're not perfect, and God knows. Just ask my staff. Ask my grandson. He's on the camera. He's looking at me. Hey, Caden. He knows more than anyone. Man, the other day, I said some things that were horrible, and I said them towards my spouse, and I felt horrible about it. But I had to go up to him, and I was like, hey, man, I am so sorry I said those things. Not only to, to, to my wife, but that you had to hear that kind of stuff, because that's not the example that I want to lead. And, you know, I love the way his response was. He goes, I forgive you, Pope. Like, good, you better in Jesus. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> but I love that he still honors me, he still respects me, he's still a part of my life. You know, because easily, if you don't address those things, they'll just go hide and they'll stay buried in there and nobody ever talks about them. And then it, it just, it's just weird in the house. Make sense? Yes. And so it's important for us to, one, talk about them. You've got to talk about technology addiction. You got to talk about cancel culture. You got to talk about college debt, your aging parents, substance abuse, addiction, mental health issues, grief, depression, all those things, the stuff that happens in our household. We got to we got to address those things. Talk about it, but talk about it in such a way that will be honorable to our heavenly Father. And let them know, hey, listen, the motivation behind this is not because I'm better than you or anything. It's like, man, you know what? We're better than this. And as friends and as family members, look, we want to honor God with our lives. And so we've got to look at these situations. What is it? What's, what is that thing? Why do we keep doing this over and over again? Why is it so easy for us to take a pill? Why? Because that pill never rejects us. That alcohol never rejects us. But whenever we're hanging around people, they reject us. And that hurts. Does that make sense? Man, I know that that rejection button is huge in many men's lives. Rejection always leads to addiction. If you have addictive behavior, I can promise you, if you trace it back, it will lead to some type of rejection in your life. You've bought into it. It's not the stuff that happens to you. It's the lie you believe when it happens to you. But you've got to find where that source, that lie is. But the first thing we have to do as peacemakers is address and talk about it. The second thing... Are you guys here this morning? Is get help from others. Notice what Galatians says. It says, share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. There's help out there for all of us. As a matter of fact, all of our elders, if you guys were here, I know y'all are in the first service. Can y'all stand up real quick? If we have any elders in the house, Emmanuel, the Fishers. Actually, the Fishers, this is their first Sunday of being an elder here at Crossroads Church. John, we're having the actual, oh, thank you guys, you can sit down. Oh, wait a minute, wait, stand up real quick. Turn, turn and face the congregation. Let them see your face. Take a picture of them. <laughs> These guys, man, I'm telling you, I don't, I don't choose elders real quickly. It took me years to find, to get me elders. You know why? Because anybody can say, anybody can put their best clothes on uh, on a Sunday morning and just talk Christian and act Christian and look like Christian, but I would watch Congregation members for seven years, three years, four years. I've seen every single one of these go through the fire. They've been tried. They've been tested. And guess what? They've come out triumphant. And they're honorable people. I trust them with my, with my life. I trust them. 
and I, and I want to encourage you to, to recognize them because we can only do so much, Natalie and I, and Pastor Joel and Emily. We have, we're, they're an extension of pastoral care, and you can trust them. They might give you some bad advice, but I might give you some bad advice too. We're not perfect, but I'm just letting you know this is real. We're trying to figure out how can we honor God with our lives, not only as a family, but as a family, a community, as we're going into our, where you go? Crossroads Church. Oh, I heard about that church. They handle snakes on Wednesdays. Yeah, we saw you here last Wednesday. We were trying to handle you, but you left. Anyway, sorry. I shouldn't, I shouldn't have said that. But we're a hospital, man, for the homeless. The beautiful thing is that, actually, I was doing some research on millennials and some research on um, Gen X, Gen Z, and some of the top issues that they're contending with here in, right now in today's day. You know what it is? It's very interesting. Here's the top 10, inflation, technology addiction, racism, pandemic, social media, the economy, acceptance, respect of differences, mental health, and the list kept on going. But I just thought it was interesting that these are the things. And the beautiful thing, even though it was disheartening, because compassion comes like, man, I want to help these guys. But we are helping them. Here at Crossroads, all of these elders, man, they're, they're, they're leading in some type of a class. You got the fishers that are leading uh, new believers. You got the carpenters that are leading in discipleship. Manuel's a chaplain of our community, man. He's helping with grief and helping with depression. We got other folks re engage or helping with, with uh, marriages, financial peace with the landers. They're helping people with their finances, inflation, helping them how to get out of debt. On and on, we're addressing a lot of these issues. So the second thing is not only do you have to talk about them, you got to get help. You got to get help, and there's help out there. There's also professional help out there, but that's the heart behind what we do. One of our core values here at Crossroads is Jesus, not us. And one of the reasons why is because people want help, and they're coming to us for help. But we always we says, hey, we're going to do everything we can to empower you and to help you and to equip you. But don't forget about the greatest helper that we have is the Holy Spirit who lives and abides on the inside of us. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what Jesus was to the disciples, the Holy Spirit, is to us to lead and to guide and to show us truth and to show us how to navigate through the issues that we face in life. I remember as a young man growing up, my favorite psalm was Psalms 25. I would preach, I would pray, I would read in my journal and write in my journal. I would, here's my prayer. It's like, God, show me your ways, O oh Lord. God, teach me your path. Show me your truth. Teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. I said, God, I got my own ways, but I want to know your ways. I have a path that I want to take, but I want to know your path. I have truth that I think is truthful and it's good, but I want to know your truth. And that would be my prayer, my constant prayer. And why? Because the Spirit of God within, would, uh, my heart would be open and he would, he would either bring counsel to me or he would give me scripture or whatever it was, he would guide me. I wanted to be a better husband to my wife. I wanted to be a better man to my kids, a better father to my kids. I wanted to be a better brother to my siblings. I wanted to be a better son to my mom and dad. And so I was like, man, everything I tried before that just was all jacked up. As a matter of fact, I just, we just met in CC Life class just a little bit ago, um, the, the bell bondsman. I forgot his name. Who was it? Mr. G. Anybody know Mr. G? Raise your hand. You guys were all in trouble. I walked in. He goes, hey, this is Mr. G. He's like, oh, Mr. G. Man, I never forget to, te to tell you thank you for bailing me out. Why did I even say that? We need help. Yes. We all need help. We just got to provide a, a, a safe place for it. But that was my favorite psalm. Why? Because I knew that if I left it up to myself, I would keep spinning around the same cycle I found myself in. Isn't that the truth? And so the Spirit of God, he's your helper. He desires to guide and to lead and to show you. You think your addiction is so heavy and so strong that you can't, you can't see yourself get out, but he can you think that that sickness is so deep and so far and the, the cancer, whatever that thing's ailing, you think it's so, you're on, you're on your death, but you're already thinking death thoughts, but he's not. You think your family is so shattered and so torn and so ripped that, man, it'll never be able to reconcile. And maybe it won't, but you can be. 
Over and over again, we see the Spirit of God wanting to lead and guide us into truth. It doesn't matter what you're facing. Nothing is too big for our Heavenly Father. And so not only do you have to talk about it and get help, the last thing you want to do is commit yourself to walk out, to walk life out together with someone. The people that you trust. You've got to walk out together. Notice what it says in Colossians. It says, make allowances for each other's faults. Can we say that together? Make allowances for each other's faults. In other words, the sooner you recognize that the closest person that you are walking with is flawed and you're flawed, the better chances you're going to be to overcome. You know, when I found out that Natalie was not perfect, it really liberated my heart. <laughs> who told you that lie? <laughs> She's like, she said, who told you that lie? But, you know, the sooner we found out that, hey, man, we're all jacked up people. Flaws are the things that connect us all. It's those things that we never address. That's why we, we show distance, and that's why we don't want to hang out. This guy's, man, I'm tired of repeating that same thing again. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about these issues. But he says, make allowances for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. others. Every time we point, there's three more people fingers pointing at us so it's important that we sit there and we commit our lives another core value that we have is something that we say relationships rule in other words the connection that I have with you Jamie and you Jessica is a relationship that I want to keep regardless of differences that we might have we got to celebrate our differences but man my relationship with you matters I love you as a brother in Christ whether I'm a pastor or not, I love you as a friend because we are here with the same, you know, we're under the same covering. We're here to reflect God here on this, on this earth. We're all wired for struggles. Why do you love church so much? Why do you love this church, many of you? I can guarantee you, most of us, we like this church because there's authenticity here, because it's relatable, because we, we're not up here, we're approachable. And I can say this for Pastor Joel and myself. It's like, hey, man, who we are in the pulpit is who you're going to find at the house, period. And I think that gives a sense of safety. Against, I, said, I was taught not to be that person. We were taught, you don't share those things with your congregation. You don't share those things in, in, if you're a leadership role. You don't share the stuff because then you'll have no authority to speak into their lives. I said, that's not true. I have found the exact opposite. Is that when we're most vulnerable and we're uh, sharing some of the stuff that we go through ourselves and in our marriages or in parenting our kids, man, we have a whole other level of authority that we can speak into their lives. And we're doing this together as a family. Does that make sense? So it's important that you make a commitment to walk life out together with individuals. You know, I've got three daughters. Right, babe? That you know of. No, we were, we've been together since we are 13 and 12, so... This is it. This is all we got is one. Not one. We got three. Not wives, but daughters. Okay. I got to get back on track. So, I, so whenever all, they were small, all the girls, I would give them some kind of a stuffed animal. I would buy them a stuffed animal. And I wasn't thinking anything of it. I didn't realize how important, how meaningful that stuffed animal would be. Look at that. That's, that, these aren't my daughters. Somebody said, that's Levi. That's not Levi. That's our guitar player. But, uh, <laughs> but my girls would walk around with that, fru- they call them fruppy and cuddles. My middle daughter, we gave her something as well, but she wasn't attached to that. She doesn't even care about any of that stuff. But these other girls, they fell in love with it. And, and they still, they're still in the house today. They're still in their home today. You'll look at cuddles, man, and eyes are all jacked up. You know, they've had open heart surgery, stitches, different colored nose. Actually, there's black marker on the nose. We just, it's been modified. It's, it's like operation. It's like something's, it's all messed up. But here, here's the beautiful thing. In the hardest times of their lives, in the most difficult and darkest hours of their lives, when they're struggling, they're tearing up, and I don't know what to say, Fruppy's right there. And cuddles is right there. It might seem weird to you, but I think, I don't know what the connection is, but I think they go to a familiar, they go to a safe place. And whatever that connection is, it's helping them. It's ministering to them. It's not going to fix it, 
but it's a place of rest. And here's what I'm saying to us, that we need to be that safe place for people. We need to be that safe place. I'm not talking about acting like a cuddled animal, but I'm just saying, hey, you can come to me, man, anytime. I'm here for you. I'm going to share my thoughts with you. I'm going to be truthful and honest with you. And I want you to know I want to be real because I want us to get we're better than this. We're better than this as brothers in Christ. Does that make sense? Be that safe place. I believe that your brokenness and my brokenness is our beauty. That our weaknesses and your weaknesses is actually our strengths. I believe that our struggles are gifts from God. So we can have an open door to minister and to love people where they're at in their life. Share them. Connect with people. Have those kind of people around your life. I don't know if it was last week, but Natty talked about the circles. If you don't have people in that, in that safe circle right there, get rid of them. They don't belong in there. You can't have 50 people in that circle, man. You can't. Well, you can, but you won't be effective. You got to make sure you have to understand these got to be people who will draw you to the Father, who draw you to a place of peace and not conflict and war or not ever address them. Oh, don't worry about that, dude. Everybody goes through that. No, not everybody. And it doesn't matter if everybody goes through it. I don't want to go through it anymore. I need some help. And you've got friends and family members right here. They might be sitting right next to you that are willing to do that and walk life with you. Amen? So what do we do? Thank you for asking. <clears throat> Here's a take home. What elephants do you have avoided in your family recently? And no, you don't have to pray about this. You can actually write it down right now. You already know what that is. What are some of the things that need to be addressed? Addressed. What are some of the things that need to be um, talked about and avoided? And two is how can you become a peacemaker? I don't know where you're at in this, but maybe you just need to talk to somebody. Start right there. Maybe you realize that, you know, I've tried to talk and they gave me some counsel. I need to go get some help, some outside help. Nothing wrong with that. I've done that hundreds of times. Maybe I just need to find someone so I can walk it out, so I can walk this thing out long term. We, we call something, Natalie and I do this with a handful of couples, two or three couples a year. We go long with them. We play long game. In other words, they have access to us any time of the day or night. Whatever hour that is, we're only going to do that one or two couples, but we'll go long with you this year. Why? Because you matter. And I have a certain amount of time that we can just do this life together. Man, let's go for it. Our small group, there's only two couples in that small group. It's a black market group. It's not out here, but it's a, it's a group I intentionally put together because I want to go long with these two couples. And we've been doing it for how many years, babe? A long time. We probably need new couples now. No, we don't. I love these couples. They're great. Actually, the where's pink hair right there? Ida, Nate, stand up real quick. Nobody ever see. nobody knows these guys. But they're in my house every Thursday, almost every Thursday. And there's another one. I don't even know the Rios is here. It doesn't matter. They won't stand up. <laughs> Molly and Julian, they're amazing people, man. I'm telling you. They're amazing people. But it's important to have folks like that in your life. Next week, we'll take a look at boundaries and what that looks like. And who knows what Pastor Joel's going to talk about, but it's going to be something that's going to be good. Did you guys get anything out of this? Yeah. Good. Hey, listen. I know it's easy and it's simple. But listen, man, I love you as a pastor. I love you as a friend. It's important for us to grow, to be challenged, to, uh, you know, make those adjustments so that we can honor God with our lives. Amen. It's very important. Let's all stand. Father, we love you. You're so good to us. We thank you, Lord God, that you give us the freedom to not only fall, but the freedom, Lord God, to get back up and trust you and trust other friends and family members in our lives. And God, I pray that you would help us. I don't know how this landed in, in families here, but Lord God, I pray that you help them get to that next step. We really, true, truly want to honor you, Father, with our lives as not only individuals, but as family members. As a community called Crossroads Church, we want to honor you here in this city, Lord God. So that when people hear about us, all they hear are good things. All they hear is, man, this is a place where you could go and talk and, and rest and get restored and get connected and get healed and get ministered to. So we just thank you for that, Lord God. We trust you. Bring us to a safe place Wednesday and next Sunday also in Jesus' name. And everyone that agreed with that said amen. Amen. Um, also, I do want to thank you for mentioning Wednesday. We're having night of worship. Remember last week we were trying to keep you all safe. 
So we said stay home. But this Wednesday, the weather's supposed to be fantastic. Come out and join us. I'll be calling a couple of y'all to cook. Uh, or not cook, but bake some cookies. Yes, We did please. it last Wednesday. They're name. so good. They're called Knee Plus Ultra uh, cookies. They're based on Pastor Marcus's message last week. And so I'll be calling some of y'all to bake them. They're awesome. We're going to have an uh, incredible testimony next Wednesday, so or this Wednesday. So you don't want to miss it. We'll see you then. Seven God bless y'all. God bless you guys. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.